Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. Hello and welcome to another episode of Super Circuit World. I am your player one, Shane Fitzgerald, and with me always is my player two, Ian McIntyre. Chickens! Ten years in the making, that joke was. <laughs> as, it, as you may have guessed, we're recording this on the 10th anniversary of Leroy Jenkins, uh, the famous, the, of course, famous World of Warcraft joke, and... Uh, well, we are talking about an RPG. It's just not an online one. Uh, today we've got uh, one of the founders of Red Hook Studios who produced the uh, independent RPG Darkest Dungeon. Uh, this guy has a long background in game design, and we're very happy to have him on the show. Please welcome Chris Barasa. Hey, guys. How's it going? I'm doing pretty good. Shane says that he's also doing good. Shane, are you doing good? out of my head oh no it's a horrifying place there's wolf cops and portal guns and Ellen McLean is trying to hit on you again oh god I thought you said it was a horrible place oh wait that sounds like an awesome place yeah <laughs> not bad have a wolf cop in your head he knows where the good beer is for, so but he, anyway for, and for those for those new to the show and to our guest those are all based off things that actually have happened in regards to Circuit 42. <laughs> you guys have uh, quite a history, a colorful history. <laughs> yeah, that one time I was wearing pants. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> well, to make it clear, the whole Wolf Cop portal gun thing is actually my Skype display picture right now. And uh, the whole getting hit on by Ellen McLean was actually my first interview with Circuit 42. So, Chris, the standard is quite high. Wow, wow. I'm going to have to bring my A-game. I haven't flirted in a while, so you're going to have to bear with me here. You know what? It's okay. You're married and you have kids, but then again, so does Ellen. But anyway, um, <laughs> enough about me. Let's talk about you, since you're that's why you're here. Um, so, as I mentioned before, you have a, a long history in game design. Uh, yeah, I mean, I should, I should clarify, my career's been mostly, you know, spent in... Um, art direction and, and, and concept art and that kind of thing. Um, I've always maintained some sort of active role on the design side, but I'm not a, uh, a game designer, per se. Okay, well, the artistic side of it is, of course, important. It's like, uh, there are many aspects of game design, and while a lot of games, especially these days, sell because of how good they look. Yeah, and I think... Uh, the, the more fused your uh, your art and your creative are with your mechanics, I think you, you make a better product. That was definitely, uh, it's been our approach um, on, on Darkest Dungeon uh, with myself and uh, and my, my co-partner, or co-founder, uh, Tyler. Oh, yeah, but we, uh, of course, should mention that you founded Red Hook Studios with uh, Tyler Sigmund, uh, who also has a long, proud history in design. Uh we certainly wish him well uh, wherever he is. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's doing well. It's been a uh, it's been a pretty wild ride recently. So we're uh, we're trying to spell each other off and get a little R and R where we can. Uh, we're prepping for a big patch though at the end of the month. So uh, I'm actually working every night this week and next week until it's done. Well, we certainly thank you for your time and <laughs> would love to have Tyler on the show as well. But there's only so much room in the back of the van. Anyway. Wait, so we're like Rain Wilson? We kidnapped so, Justin Red Levin and shot him in our van? You're the one who's always making the reference to the kidnapping in the van and the burlap sack. That, that's so. actually a, a series that Rain Wilson Shush. has. He actually, it's called Rain Wilson in a van. And he kidnapped Justin Gordon Levin. He told him that he had candy. <laughs> I kind of prefer this. I kind of prefer the thing. Where Michael Mando kidnaps Christopher Mintz Plus just to, just to promote Far Cry 3, but uh, different strokes. Um, so, uh, so Chris, for those who aren't entirely familiar with your work, what kind of things have you worked on? Uh, well, I've been in games for 10 or, or 12 years. Um, I've worked on a bunch of different platforms. I did, I did a Sonic game for 
PSP. I did a uh, Monster Lab kind of game for um, for the Wii. Um, I worked, uh, you know, freelance for a whole bunch of companies, Fantasy Flight games and, uh, you know, board games, Warhammer 40K type stuff, Privateer Press, that kind of thing. Um, I worked at a company called Propaganda Games on a Pirates of the Caribbean title. Um, I've done a stint at Microsoft. Uh, a lot of stuff, you know, when you work in games long enough, there's a lot of cancellations, there's a lot of offs, um, there's a lot of NDAs. And so, um, oftentimes, some of your best work can just sort of sit on a on a shelf somewhere in like an Indiana Jones style warehouse. Um, so I've done a lot of done a lot of stuff that'll never see the light of day. But uh, that's just kind of the nature of the industry. Yeah, that it, that is unfortunately how it goes sometimes. Now, you did mention uh, a Pirates of the Caribbean game. I believe that was the uh, the uh, canceled Armada of the Damned. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I was uh, I worked on that for about three and a half, almost four years. Uh, I was one of the first hires on the game. I started out as a uh, as a lead concept, and then moved into um, associate or art director or character art director, and um, and then I from there I was started getting involved in like the the story and kind of the overarching you know creative uh, direction of the game. That game, yeah, it's one of those games. It is unfortunate that what happened uh, with it's not be, with it's not being released because. Um, you know, there are very few, like, movie games that really either match or exceed the, the movies that they're based off of. You know, like, of course, like, Batman on the NES, uh, GoldenEye on the N64, and... Ah, uh, GoldenEye. I really think, like, with Armada of the Damned, like, the more where I saw this game, like, I honestly didn't care for Pirates after the first movie, but even I was excited to play this, and that says a lot. Yeah, it was it was a good game to be honest with you. I think um, you know I think we we're about six months away from from shipping, um, and uh, y- you know I'm not exactly sure what happened, but, but um, I think the marketing costs were maybe prohibitively high or something like that. But um, yeah, it was it was a solid RPG. It was a single player game. There was a lot of interesting kind of dialogue stuff. It was kind of like Fable meets you know Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, and one of the big hooks we had was the sort of on-the-deck on ship camera that you've seen subsequently in Assassin's Creed. Um, so that was that was kind of interesting to see that game kind of come out a couple of years or a year and a half or so after um, after our game was canceled because we basically were sort of like exactly doing that exact thing. Um, and we were pretty excited about it. You could board and have fights and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think it would have been a it would have been a solid title for sure. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention that the game definitely had a fable kind of feel to it in the sense that the character you make could go good or evil and have different abilities based on those. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of really wild stuff. Like you could, go, we called it legendary or dreaded. Um, I mean, you're still a good guy, but essentially the difference was: are you sort of like, a, um, like a, a, a a good Boba Fett, if that makes sense, or like a like a like a Batman type character. So you could do all these flashy sword moves if you went legendary, and it was a lot of like sparkles and golden flourishes. And then if you went dreaded, you were kind of like this Batman of the sea, uh, big you know barnacle encrusted anchor, a lot of big heavy moves, um, you know undead magic and that kind of stuff. So it was it was really cool. It was a lot of fun to work on, and we had a we had a great team. It really is a shame that game never saw the light of day, especially uh, knowing how close it was to getting chipped out. Yeah, but I mean, like I said, you, it's it's crushing at the at the time um, when that stuff happens. But it really does happen a, an unfortunate amount, um, and you just kind of uh, you just get used to to that type of thing and, and kind of learn to roll with the punches. And you certainly did that uh, when you and Tyler formed Red Hook Studios together in 2013. Hey, can I comment really briefly? Uh, the moment you said Batman of the Sea, I don't know if you ever read it, but all I can think of is the like Elseworlds Batman pirate comic book by Chuck Dixon. Oh, no, I didn't read it. I, probably I should have. Now that I'm just sounds like, awesome, right? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was more of like just my, my sort of internal design... Um, the philosophy for the character, you know, in terms of like how he's going to look and and that kind of thing. And I'm a huge Batman fan. Obviously, not so huge that I read that. You kind of busted me there, I guess. But um, 
Womp. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and with that, Shane, your question of Duluma. Uh, right. So, as I said, you you and Tyler formed Red Hook Studios in 2013. Uh, what it, what exactly inspired this idea of going into business for yourself? Uh, well, I done I had done a lot of different jobs in games, and and my own kind of indie game was just not one of them. Um, so I, I wanted to give it a shot. Um, you know, I'd I'd been a like a, a concept artist. I'd, I'd been a lead artist. I've been a studio art director. Um, I worked in cartoons, um, tried all this different different stuff, you know, all these different applications of commercial art and concept art and that kind of thing. Um, so it just, you know, um, after, for a couple of years, and, you know, it feels, as a tangent, that feels quite good to sort of earn a living freelancing. You kind of feel like you're catching and killing your food in a certain extent. Like you, you go out and you secure clients and you deliver good work and they come back to you. It's very satisfying. But after a while, you start to sort of, see through it and it becomes a bit of a grind and I started wondering sort of you know what am I what am I actually doing this for beyond you know paying paying next month's bills sort of thing so I had a bit of runway saved up and um, Tyler and I had been talking about this idea for an RPG where you know the size of your shoulder pad didn't matter it was it was you know your state of mind which is really the measure of, of how effective you were and 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 how awful it would really be to be an adventurer and you know this this sort of spurned a whole bunch of different discussions and we would meet up and have a couple of drinks and we just kept circling back to it so after a while um you know the timing lined up for both of us and uh we just said let's uh let's make a run for it awesome man you certainly hit the ground running with your first title uh darkest dungeon uh just want to bring up the kickstarter for this because it's really impressive you're asking you were asking for seventy five thousand dollars you ended yeah. up getting over three hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. It was uh it was a really, really exciting time for sure. Um yeah, it took a lot of preparation, uh and and, a, and there was a lot of debate and discussion around how to structure the Kickstarter. You know, we looked at a lot of other successful campaigns. You know, obviously we were sort of drafting behind Banner Saga and um you know, some of the uh, the double fine stuff and, and just kinda looked at what they had done and Put our, try to put our best foot forward. Um, one of the things we decided we didn't want to do right away was this sort of personal appeal video um, where you sort of sit in front of the camera and, and, and sheepishly kind of explain why you're worth investing in. Um, we felt like we should make something where the, the product stands on its own. And so, you know, our, our Kickstarter trailer was just purely narrative, just purely tonal, um, just meant to get you straight to the game uh, because we figured that's, that's what really people are there for. They're not there for us. They're there for for the game itself. And you know, we need to we need to show them why it's it's cool beyond just like being nice guys or whatever. Or you could do what uh, what um, was it Seth is it Seth Fisher? I, I'm I'm sorry. Who's the um uh, who's the, who's the creator of Fez who really really loves his Twitter page? Yeah, Phil Don't Fish. Fish. You can see what Phil Fish does and insult people. That's a good way to make money. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think uh, I think what we did maybe worked worked for us. I, I'm not ready to go the insulting route. Yeah, it's just so yet, weird but, how uh, that doesn't work knows, out. You know? you know, like insulting people on the internet doesn't seem to help much. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we don't talk much about the okay. bill fish. But moving away from that to happier topics. Um. I was actually talking to um one of our other co-hosts earlier today, and we were talking about how um, with interesting decisions, we'll use the word interesting on the parts of large companies like Konami, and admittedly you can't really drag Capcom into that bus because recently they've been making some really strong decisions, but you've got a lot of major game companies either making bizarre decisions or focusing way too much on multimedia instead of just focusing on making games. But with your but with your project right now, and with games and with stuff like Bloodstain, might be number nine. Do you see like game just gaming as a whole and the way gaming production is being done as moving farther and farther to that market and like big companies like Konami and their interesting decision making kind of going by the wayside? I mean, I, I really. Big sweeping statements like that kind of 
give me pause. I, I don't. I can't really prognosticate about you know the future of the industry as a whole. Uh, what I see is that you know there with crowdfunding and, and sort of the sort of resurgence or, or the the rise of indies, as some people like to call it. Um, I just look at it as as more avenues to more content. I, I really believe that you know all kinds of games should get made. I don't have to buy or enjoy all kinds of games, but I think you know they should all be they should all be produced. It's healthy, it, you know, to have a a huge swath of, of different type of stuff, just like the same way there's, you know, hundreds of different kinds of movies out there. Um, so I, I don't think that any you know, large companies are going to necessarily go away or radically change their tactics. And I don't necessarily think they, they need to, but I am happy that there's, you know, the, this sort of like alternative um, funding models that allow smaller companies with maybe more offbeat, interesting, you know, left to center ideas that that have a path to success and a path to market um because i you know i enjoy playing playing those games i also enjoy the the big sort of some of the the more risk averse titles that that are deliver a little bit more expected kind of gameplay there's still some entertainment value to be found in those so i I mean i wouldn't even want them to go away you know like give me halo 7 i'll play it i'm sure it's gonna be entertaining less upon that and more like you know the companies will definitely be there but like you're saying that this will give it more, more of an alternative route, and it seems like, you know, it seems like a lot of these developers are really drawing on what's really interesting to gamers instead of worrying so much about, you know, the image and the way it's pushed forward and are actually focusing on the product itself. Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, when you're small, you, you have to focus on the product because it's your, it's your lifeblood and it's your path to, to, to earning back whatever investment that you, you may have put into the game. So, I mean, for us... We sunk pretty much everything we had, you know, into the game. We all lived off our savings, our RSPs. It's very, very risky proposition, especially for for guys who are a little bit older, like like myself. You know, I've got a couple of kids and a mortgage, and a wife, and um, so my opportunity cost is a lot higher. And um, then then say somebody's coming out of school, like my cost of living is higher. So um, I have to focus much more on the on the product and and less around the the fluff surrounding it just because if I don't focus on the product it's not going to get done if it doesn't get done I can't recoup any of my investment essentially um so sometimes that's just out of necessity if that makes sense I think uh, it's good that you mentioned that because I think a lot of people tend to forget that like they see a game on like Xbox Live or PSN or they see some uh, I've met a lot of people who won't support things like Kickstarter and it's like these are people trying to make a product, and these are people who, like you said, are making the product and doing what you do out of necessity. I mean, there. The sad thing is, there are some people out there, you know, that we won't talk about on the during the show that have used and abused Kickstarter and used and abused the crowdfunding. And the problem is that people like that, you know, they've made it so. You know, people like you, people like uh, Koji Garashi may have may have trouble but it looks like you guys have really pushed people have really pushed past that and understood you know that you guys are that you and a lot of the other developers right now are making these really legitimate projects and the great thing is you've like i said you've moved past you know these people who have abused who have abused it sorry that was a rambling answer no, it's uh, yeah. I I think there's there's some truth to that. I think also like whenever somebody says that something is dead to me, like you know, oh, early access is dead, um, yeah, Kickstarter's dead. I, I actually look at that as an opportunity. Um, you know, the the trend. You know, certainly uh, we had always always talked about taking Darkest Dungeon to early access. We felt like we'd benefit a lot from the from the playtest telemetry and and just the general feedback. You know, being that it is such a systems heavy game. Um, and so the, the prevailing wind was that early access is, is dead and, you know, it's garbage and, and, and don't do it. And if you do do it, no one's going to care. So we just sort of looked at that as an opportunity to come into early access with something that was, you know, polished and fun and, and stood on its own. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of positive press for doing that. Um, so you know, some people like to say that, you know, Kickstarter is, is dead or it's, it's going away. I, I don't know that that's true. I think there's always room for, for quality projects to to shine and I, and I don't think any of these platforms um, are or even should disappear um, but there's always going to be people or organizations who are sort of you know maybe trying to cut some corners and 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 get to a fast dollar but you know as these platforms mature there's gonna be more and more measures in place to, to prevent that kind of abuse so Shane oh yeah um, yeah I find it kind of odd for people to say things like Kickstarter are dead because 
like it seems to me like crowdfunding has allowed a lot of talented and uh, uh, like a lot of great talent out there to you know produce a lot of great uh, material like uh, one of the first big Kickstarter success stories I heard about was for uh, the game Shovel Knight yeah definitely yeah and that kind of convinced people to look into this crowdfunding thing and say okay well I've got this project you think people might support that and then they dump piles of money into that and we get a, a great game or a great uh, independent movie or something like that yeah I mean I just watched The Babadook that's a great I'm a huge horror fan and, and I thought that was amazingly well done that was kickstarted and there's a lot of really cool games that I don't think would have found you know a home under the publisher model um, you know even high profile successes like Hyperlight Drifter um I, I don't think necessarily there, there would have been publishing interest for that title, at least not to the same extent um, that they got through crowdfunding. So I think it's it's great. Yeah, you mentioned early access as well, and I will say that uh, I think early access is one of the more abused features of Steam because there's a lot of developers out there who will basically just take the opportunity to shove a half-finished product onto onto early access and basically take the money and maybe do something with it which is really a shame because like games like Darkest Dungeon prove that early access can work in practice as an example of basically uh, here's the game that we've worked on now help us make it better yeah yeah exactly that, that was always our our sort of um, mindset and, and our philosophy towards early access. It was, we, we felt like what we had advertised was this sort of um, RPG that, that gamified stress responses and, you know, it was dark and difficult and, and all the rest of it. And we felt that our early access build, you know, was everything that we had talked about the game being. Um, and then people could look forward to, you know, more, more content, um, uh, more features on top of that, but that the core of the game that we had sort of advertised was already there. Um, so we weren't sort of, you know, say, saying that it was a game about X and then the early access build not having that in it. Um, and I think that's important, you know, when you when you go to take your your game to early access, that you you deliver on the fundamental promise of the game right out of the gate, and then you know the the time in early access is meant for improving, refining. Um, you know, tuning, balancing, Some, that kind of uh, thing. Something I wanted to touch on, uh, one more, uh, regarding, um, uh, regarding Kickstarter. There, there's been like weird situations where you'll have, uh, one of the best parts about it also, in regard, in, you know, in addition to helping a lot of independent, in addition to helping a lot of independents make the games that they want to put out, you'll have something weird like, uh, either of you ever heard of the comic book Fairy Quest? No. It was, no. It was done by Paul Jenkins and Humberto Ramos, and they kept trying to get the comic book out there, and like no companies would buy it at all, and nobody would do anything. And it's weird because you have an established name, especially like Ramos. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. And then Paul Jenkins. Yeah, I know wrote, him for uh, sure. The, he wrote the Inhumans. He wrote or X Men. He wrote the um, Origin of the True Story of Wolverine, and a bunch of other stuff. And they went on Kickstarter. They just said fuck it. And that was one of the first big media projects to go on Kickstarter. And they were offering things like statues and all this other stuff. And then Boom saw it, and they said, you know, uh, after you're done with the initial Kickstarter work and putting that out there, we want to distribute the rest, and we want to actually fund the rest of the book. And I just thought... Cool. Sorry. Yeah, that's great. I mean, those... Uh... Well, I just <laughs> thought it was interesting. Oh no, that, go ahead. You know, Sorry. Like two established people like that weren't able to get a work through, it, weren't able to get that work out there, but then because of that, they were able to get something done and also get a major attention from a company like Boom. Yeah, I think a lot of the larger organizations want their um, are very risk averse, and so if you can demonstrate that there's an audience for what you're doing and you can demonstrate that it, that it does have appeal and invalidate the concept essentially um, then then they're much more interested um, certainly you know it, it was the I, I feel like it would have been in the same situation had we sort of had to approach publishers with our game there would have been a lot of discussion around you know well is it is it broad enough is it you know this enough is that enough um, 
Whereas, you know, thanks to thanks to Kickstarter and and uh, and early access, we're able to sort of pursue, you know, our our pure vision of, of what we wanted to make, and we always knew we we weren't trying to make a game for everybody. Um, and, and now we can sort of, you know, really really pay that out because we're not beholden to sort of any sort of corporate expectations in that regard. Exactly. Yes. Um, I was going to say, Shane, did you have another question? <laughs> oh, actually, uh, I was just uh, going to start talking about, uh, more directly talking about Darkest Dungeon. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to say right off the bat, I absolutely love this game. Like, it's, I admit to ha- having, like, over 200 games in my Steam library, and that's definitely one of the standout titles for me because I'm a big RPG fan. And, and, like, more and more I'm getting hooked on to the roguelikes for the... It really feels like something is at stake when you know your character uh, will, can not only die, but not cannot be brought back. Like, there's no Phoenix Towns in this game. Um, right. There's no little fairies in bottles. Once your character's dead, done. Um, this game really kind of grabs me with... Uh, a lot of its features, especially the art style, like I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed like the gothic look of it, which is one of the features uh, listed for the game. Um, so, I'm guessing as as an art director that you were uh, that you were one of the main people working on the art style for the game. Ah, uh, well, like, I'm the art director and I'm the art department. Um, there's only five of us, so yeah, I'm I'm doing uh, I'm doing all the drawing. Uh, so thanks, that that's cool to hear. <laughs> it's a shit ton of drawing, so um, I'm always pleased when people respond well to it, for sure. Um, and uh, of course, there's also the fact that the game is described as having a Lovecraftian-inspired story. Yeah. Uh, both Tyler and I are huge uh, huge Lovecraft fans, um, and uh, we felt like it would be. We felt like it paired nicely with the subject matter. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, how people cope under pressure and stress and, and you know, Lovecraft does that stuff so well. So we just thought there was room to bring him out of the 20s and into the Middle Ages and sort of take that for a ride. Yeah, I feel like um, when people talk about H.P. Lovecraft, they primarily talk about, uh, they primarily talk about, like, the whole Call of Cthulhu aspect of it. But the thing I really liked about uh, Lovecraft is just his look into like insanity and madness and the human mind and soul, and that's something that this game I feel does pretty well. Is along with the uh, eldritch horror aspect of it. Yeah, I think a lot of people mistake. Well, I shouldn't say a lot of people. Uh, when people first maybe get into to Lovecraft, um, it, it can be a common sort of abstraction to view it as like well it's just about a giant monster and i think you know what it's really about is is the is the paralyzing realization that mankind is completely insignificant and, and this sort of fear of not mattering or, or being just cosmically vulnerable um and I, I think that's really a powerful thing it's uh it's the antithesis to a lot of modern religion and it, it, you know I, I think it's kind of cool that he was, he was really a pioneer in that regard. It's not so much about the giant beast under the water, it's what the beast actually signifies in terms of, you know, what people mean to the earth or, or the universe or whatever. Um, so we're definitely having a lot of fun playing playing in that space and and uh, and, and taking, you know, what, what makes sense from that, that type of stuff. We're, we're not a Lovecraft game. We don't sit in his mythos. Um, you know, there's no Cthulhu in our game. Uh, there's no Arkham, that kind of stuff. Um, but I definitely think that you know we have more than enough influences to be safely called a, a Lovecraftian influence think, title for sure. Um, I just want to touch on it real. I talk, touch on the H.P. Lovecraft subject real quick. The thing that a lot of people forget about is the tone, you know. And it sounds like from what you said that you guys are really connecting to that. And I've actually always found the tone of Lovecraft story and the better Lovecraft media to be actually the most interesting thing about it. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think the tone is more important than what specifically happens. The tone and theme is, is sort of the, the driving um, 
thrust behind a lot of that stuff, and, and it certainly was for us and uh, coming up with the with the story uh, for the game. And you know, so far we haven't really incorporated it a whole lot. We've got a, I think, a pretty decent setup, and there's definitely going to be a resolution. I mean, it, it's got some roguelike influences as a game, but um, you know, you you can beat it. There's a there's a story that you can kind of resolve, and uh, I'm really excited to to pull the curtain back a little bit more on that stuff as, as early access progresses. Yeah, what, uh, another thing I want to talk about in the game is what you call the affliction system, mm -hmm. which is essentially a kind of insanity mechanic. Now, I'm a big fan of insanity mechanics in games. Uh, one of the best examples I feel comes from the GameCube title Eternal Darkness. I never played Eternal Darkness, but um, we've got on that comparison that a fair bit, actually. People are like, oh, yeah, it's kind of like Eternal Darkness, and and yeah, I mean, I've heard nothing but good things. I, I, I wish I had more time to play games, quite honestly. But um, yeah, I, I definitely want to go and check it out. Um, I think uh, we tried to sort of, you know, I've I've played a lot of like Lovecraft games, and I've played games, you know, with similar sanity mechanics. There's certainly a lot of war games model morale. Um, for for our game, we wanted to take it, you know, a step further, and I, I think. Where the ins where the sanity kind of idea falls short is that it's a binary thing. Like, you start at zero, and then you're on the way to being insane, and then when you're full, you're insane, and either the game's over or you have all these debilitating effects. Um, f for us, you know, you start at zero, you, you go to full, and then when you're at full, that's where we branch off to one of these eight different um, afflictions, we call them, which are basically like a family of stress responses. So, you know, you can become selfish or paranoid or abusive or masochistic, and um, the, char the, the heroes will start you know, acting and behaving in ways that, you know, maybe isn't ideal for you as a player and maybe, you know, wrecks your strategy a little bit. Um, but that re reinforces the idea that they're, they're vulnerable. Um, but um, having sort of that branching uh, climax where, you know, you don't not quite sure which direction to go when they get to full, I think adds a lot of interest um, as opposed to a straight sanity system where, uh, you know, you know what the destination is, you know the road you're on. Um, in our game, it's a little less predictable. And, of course, sometimes... Um, Unlike a lot of sanity games, uh, in Darkest Dungeon, the heroes can actually um, shake off the stress, and they, they get to their full stress capacity, and they actually succeed a, a resolve check, and they become heroic, and they can uh, buff themselves and become extra powerful in a lot of ways, the same way sometimes you know pressure does good things to people. Um, so we wanted to, to really explore and, and bring a lot more depth than maybe um, other games have uh, in, in that regard. I, I certainly enjoy the depth in this game. And one of my favorite features is when you're in combat with enemies, the positioning of the members of your party actually does matter. It affects what exactly they can do in a fight. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, I, going back to like Eye of the Beholder, Eye of the Beholder Two, like I, ju I just love that the sort of um, the fact that even Dark Souls. Um, did this, you know, when you're in a hallway and you've got a big weapon, it bounces off the walls. Um, the, the claustrophobia and um, you know, you can't always do every move, and uh, I, I just always found that to be a really compelling limiter. Um, so that was something that we were really excited about, and I think uh, it's worked out pretty well. And we have a big patch coming at the end of May, and we're actually adding some more uh, mechanics into the into the combat, which I think are going to add even more depth to it. So that'll be exciting. Fantastic. That was actually uh, my next question. Um, what does the future hold for Darkest Dungeon and Red Hook Studios? Uh, well, we're shooting to ship later this year. Um, we're adding, at the end of this month, we're adding um, three new bosses, uh, two new hero classes. Um, along the way, you know, after that, we're going to be adding town events. So when you get back to town, you know, maybe the plague's in town and all your plague doctors have to stay in town, but they gain, you know, resolve or, or something to that effect. Don't quote me. That's just, you know, an idea we're throwing around. Um then after that, we're going to be looking at adding the Cove, which is another dungeon environment, you know, with its own set of monsters, interactive objects, all that good stuff, bosses. Uh, and then finally, we'll add the, the Darkest Dungeon, which will allow players to sort of take their, their level six, their, their high-level guys, and send them on uh, to try and resolve the, the story arc for the game. And uh, we're not talking about the Darkest Dungeon. We're not going to say anything about it until it actually comes out um, when the game fully launches and exits early access. Um, but we will say that it's a, it's a one-way trip, so you can't flee the Darkest Dungeon. So it's, And you have to do it a couple of times. That sounds awesome. I cannot... So the, the stakes are going to be high. And uh, 
I'm just going to say uh, my birthday's near the end of May, so thank you for the gift. <laughs> hey, no worries. Yeah, thanks for letting us know months ago so that we could plan it and, and get it all it ready for you. It was all <laughs> part of a plan. <laughs> it's supposed to be a secret, Chris, damn it. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. Okay, so if we've uh, piqued your interest at all, you can certainly look up more information at uh, darkestdungeon.com and... Uh, the game is available on Steam right now. I believe it's about uh, twenty dollars. Yeah, it's twenty bucks. Um, there's probably, I mean, I, we say about thirty, thirty-five hours of content. I, we have people on Steam who've played hundreds of hours. It's crazy, <laughs> but it's uh, it's awesome that people are having fun and there's a lot of uh, let's plays and, and YouTube videos out there, and uh, people can check it out and see if it's a game they think they'd enjoy. Yeah, a friend of mine, uh, Phantom Savage. I actually bought him a copy of the game. Uh, because I knew it was right up his alley. He enjoys games with, like, the dark gothic feel and the insanity mechanics. So he's done a couple of uh, episodes on that. You can check that out uh, at his YouTube channel. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug, Chris? No, not really, right? I mean, we're just really grateful to have found an audience, and, and it's awesome to hear that people are, are enjoying the game and, and that they're, um, you know... Having fun with sort of like this different take on sort of the RPG conventions, it's just been really exciting and, and very validating for us. So we're just thrilled and, and very, very grateful for the support and want to keep, you know, building the game, adding depth, adding content, and making it a better and better experience. We'd love to support this thing for for years, you know? I just wanted to say, I've been looking, like, pretty yeah. much, you know, when you've been talking to Shane, uh, I've been looking at all the artwork the whole time. And as somebody who grew up on people like Gabriel Ba and Mike Mandola, I really like this work because it actually reminds me a lot of the best of like Gabriel Ba and Mike Mandola. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, they're great. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, they're great. Obviously, Mignola was a big influence when I was cooking up the uh, the art style for the game. Um, Guy Davis, um, Dan Pinochet, Victor Kalvachev. You know, I, I grew up reading comics and so i was i've been doing digital painting for so long that it's uh awesome to be able to work in a in a different style and sort of pay homage to the the characters and or, or the styles and, and artists that got me interested in art in um, the first place one last thing for my end just to geek out a little bit um like the marquee by um guy davis Yo, it's my yeah. It's one of my favorite books of all time shane do you shane chris do you mind if we take a little bit to talk about so I can talk about comic books and nerd out. Oh, go for it. We're actually like okay. really at schedule right awesome. now. We can talk about comic books. But um, I don't know. They were, like that. That's that's one of my favorite comic books. And then there was one other one, uh, Jenny Finn, the one he did with Mike Pagnola. Yep, I've read Jenny Finn. Yep, yeah, I, yep. I found that was a, a good one too. Flight. I was at a used bookstore. And they had the complete trade paperback for like four dollars, and I'm like, "Oh my god, that's even a, yeah. that's a crime you can get it for that had, little." Because they had it in like a closeout section, and I just bought it right away. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the Marquis is probably one of my favorite. Like, I have the 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 collected, you know, 350 page epic or whatever and uh it's probably one of my favorite novels of all time like never mind that it's a graphic novel like it doesn't matter um it's just a great story it is brutal and uncompromising and it's everything that i love about like um you know just that gothic tone and and uh, the redemption and the fallibility of people it, it just it has it all for me it's really and, my yeah, one of my favorites if not uh, my favorite mind. Nevermind no. is awesome. It's like if oh, you took I have not. like Dark City and turned the bad guys into the good guys. Mm -hmm. It's really oh, damn cool. That sounds interesting. It's like this bizarre ass science yeah, fiction cool. comic that was published by Dark Horse. Like the first time I saw it was when Do you guys remember those weird those like little promo, like little Sunday comic style things that Dark Horse would put out in comic stores for, back about ten years ago? And it was almost like having, like, the Sunday comics, except it was little comic strips from a bunch of different Dark Horse strips. Like, you had, like, Sock Monkey by Tony Millionaire. You had the Neverman. You had, like, random little Star Wars strip. 
And they were like these free little promotional things. It was like having the Sunday comics from when you were a little kid, except it was all Dark Horse comics. That sounds awesome. I grew up in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories in Canada. Um, and so, like, we only got a comic shop, like, uh, and I think when I was about ready to leave. So I missed out on all the sort of cool promotional small stuff. It's like I could get, like, a few comics at the drugstore going up. Yeah, I, I had, we traveled a lot. Like, I've been through, I think, half the United States and then, like, four or five different countries. And so I got to be exposed to a lot of stores, but my favorite still has to be either Austin Books here in Texas or when I got to go to Golden Apple um, out in Rose. Is that a big uh, comic book store somewhere? Oh, Golden Apple is the, like, the, it's the comic store that all the celebrities go to. Like, oh, okay. like Samuel Jackson buys his books there, Mark, Mark Hamill, Bridget Fonda, Matt Groening buys his comics there, Sam Lee comes like every other week. Huh, that's and, cool. Like all, it's all surrounded, they've got all these whiteboards on the walls that are all sketched by different artists. So you've got like a Jim Mafood sketch next to an Alex Ross, like Alex Ross sketch. Cool. And they haven't used permanent nice. markers. Where, where is this? Where is this place? In New uh, York? Uh, no, it's in L.A. It's on, oh, wow. it's on Barrows in Hollywood. I gotta go and check that out someday. Yeah. Sounds awesome. We so should no. all get, we should all get jetpacks and fly, fly over there. <laughs> I gotta say, if I was gonna get a jetpack, it probably wouldn't be the first place I'd go. But, uh, Did you just I'll go, go there after. I was thinking of having jetpacks, for God's sake. Yeah, I'd just fly around for a while. It's like, first yeah, but... to the moon, <laughs> and then go to the whole comics. Probably should have thought. Probably should have thought of that heat show on the way back from the moon. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of um, Baltimore. I mean, the the, the novel uh, that uh, Mike Mignola did with Christopher Golden, and then I got a few of the comics. They seem pretty cool. Um, the the problem is when you're making a game, like you can't. Like I didn't have any time to, you know, really play other games or read comics to any extent. I think. Um, so my my knowledge sort of drops off after the Image Comics craze. I still have all my old Savage Dragons and Wildcats and all that stuff. <laughs> well, Wildcats was patchy. Like sometimes it was amazing. Like when James Robinson and Alan Moore was doing it. And I hate to say it, but sometimes it was really bad. Like the first issues. I those are the only ones I ever knew. Right, were the Jim Lee, uh, Brandon Choi. Oh, you never read like the, the original. Did, um... No, because I, I just sort of like I went to university. I traveled yeah. around. I kind of you know. Felt like I, I always loved comics, but um, yeah, I just did some other stuff for a while, and then uh, yeah, so I grew up reading all those like comics that everybody makes fun of, you know, oh. like all the, the image breakaway comics that were you know all flash and no substance, and I like <laughs> that was kind of like what I grew up to, on. Like all the fun stuff about Silver Age comics, like the first issues were a little bit let's punch this guy's guts out, but then like a couple issues in, it started to become like the Silver Age tribute book. And that's when I really like The Frank it. Darling plot twist was pretty awesome. Like, when you realize that the guy who got him onto the Chicago police force actually, like, did a deal with the mob to do it. And, like, it, like, compromised himself. Like, that was pretty cool. I remember my mind, my tiny little brain was blown back then by that by that twist. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make both of you guys hate me. I was at the, um, what has become, like, the famous image reunion at Atomic Comics, where Jim Lee, Tom McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, was Portacio... Eric Larson, Mark Silvestri, all of them were there. And it was our first time being together again for almost 20, in almost 20 years. Holy shit. Damn. Yeah. And, um, people can say what they will about Liefeld, and I know they say a lot, but, um, <laughs> like, this has been the second time I had met him at a show. First time, I just assumed that, I just assumed it was a standard comic convention thing, where they were like, oh, hi, good to meet you, blah, 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 then they move on. Um... When I saw him at the Image at the uh, Image Comics reunion, he kind of gives me that sideways look like he's trying to figure out something. And then he put, points at me and says, I saw you at Phoenix Comic Con! And That's said, cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm on your forum. I'm at our back. Oh, this is for you! And he just hands me a sketchbook. Like, he... Ah, that's awesome. Yeah, apparently one of my friends said that the guy in front of him asked about the sketchbooks. And he said, I'm sorry, man, those are actually only for certain people. And you're a certain person. Yep. Oh, that's cool. That and I kind of, um, I kind of called out Topic Farland in a very nice, in a kind of a, in, in a nice way. 
Uh, I, I brought spot number eight, the tribute he had done to his own cover, Spider-Man number one. And I did the standard thing, and I said, you know, it's great to meet you, big fan of Sp- your work on Spider-Man, big fan of Spawn. And then I pull out the comic, and I've always wanted to meet the guy who would do a tribute to himself. And biggest <laughs> shit-eating grin that I could muster. And he looks at me silent for a minute. And then he oh. just starts busting up laughing. And, his, and he just <laughs> says, it's, it's great to meet you, man. I said, it's great to meet you, too. That's awesome. I think, they, I think a lot of people in like a lot of creative fields get so tired of the fanboy mentality that they just want to meet someone who will make a stupid joke or act like a normal person, you know? Because you can't, you can't put people like that on a pedestal because all it's going to make, all it's going to do is make it almost, first off, it'll make them uncomfortable. And second off, when you put somebody on that level, you're not able to just able to communicate with them as a person, you know? Yeah, you might be right. I, uh, I haven't met a whole lot of my, um, you know, idols <laughs> really I haven't had the opportunity. Um, I did meet, uh, and got to hang out with Joe Mad, um, in Austin at South by Southwest. So that was pretty oh, cool. Nice. But, um, yeah, he's an amazing guy, really nice guy. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I think the less you sort of ooh and ah, the more, uh, more you can just get on with hanging out. It's cool when you can meet these people that you like really admire and then just kind of be really casual and cool with them. Like, uh, live, like I live in Edmonton and that's where Bioware is and they make Mass Effect and all that stuff. And, uh, Mark Muir, who does the male voice of Commander Shepard lives here as well. And I've had the uh, the good fortune to meet up with him on a number of occasions, and we've actually uh, we've actually become I'm hesitant to say friends, like we're all like best buds and stuff like that, because we don't meet that often. But we're pretty cool with each other. Like I can just talk to him like he's a regular dude, because that's exactly what he is. Yeah, that's cool. I enjoyed Mass Effect 2. I played the female Shepard, though, so I can't say that I uh, was privy to his work. I tried to make her look like my wife. That was my whole ah, that was my whole goal. And then I was crushed when my only options were to have her make out with the frog guy at the end. <laughs> so I never played Mass Effect 3. Uh, that would be so... <laughs> she was so bobbed. I was like, this is it, this is it. We're going into the, you know, the abyss. Do you, who do you want? And she's like, oh... What's the Australian girl's name? I'm like, I know, it's all going to happen. And then it was like, Garrus or, or Frog Boy. She's like, oh, just give me Frog Boy, I'm going to bed. Uh, I'm just picturing, so like, the hypothetical opening of the next game, where it, like, opens up, and you've got, like, the swelling epic music, and then you just cut, and it's her, and it's Shepard and the Frog Boy with, like, cigarettes in bed. And it's like, you son of a bitch! <laughs> I mean, he was a cool dude. He was worried about his kid and everything. You know, yeah, I like I like the frog like guy. The to- he's like the Thomas Jane of uh, Mass Effect. He just wants to get his kids back. Yeah, for sure. Pretty much. It does take away. I love the Mass Effect series. It's one of my favorite uh, game series of all time. But it does take a little. It does go away a little bit. It does realize there are only options for sex. Possibly before you die, are a cockroach and a frog. Maybe that's the message. Maybe you shouldn't be so motivated by such, uh, you know, transient, shallow things. <laughs> well said. And to be Maybe. perfectly fair, to be perfectly fair, as much as I as much as I love Mark, as much as he's my boy, I gotta pick Femme Shep too because Jennifer Hill's hot. That's pretty much all there is to it. Oh, I've never seen her picture. Ah, uh, well, she's hot and from Newfoundland, so there you go. Um, oh, really? She's from Newfoundland. Eh? That's yes. pretty cool. Yes, Commander Shepard is 100% Canadian because no matter what gender he is, he's voiced by a Canadian. That's awesome. And Mass Effect 3 actually starts in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> so, now that we've completely gone off track, I think it's time to I think it's time to wrap this one up. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. It's been great talking with you. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on, and uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, all the kind words about the game. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can learn more about the game at darkestdungeon.com. Uh, of course, as Chris mentioned, there are plenty of Let's Plays and videos on YouTube where you can check out 
uh, the amazing art style and the very, very cool, nostalgic and fresh gameplay that there is to find in this style of RPG. And of course, you can uh, look us up at our Circuit 42 circuit42.com, our Circuit 42 uh, YouTube channel and Facebook page. And, uh, Go on there and have a grand old time. Yeah. And I believe we mentioned this on the last episode, but once again, thank you all for 2,500 likes on Facebook. You guys are awesome. Chris, like, I have more than that. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> See that's the see that's the that's, that's the difference. Like if I was Chris, I was I'd like I was like, like shit. That's all right. Good for you guys. That's the, I was just letting you do your thing, man. I didn't want to interrupt you. See, like with like, my cool. sister Huber, I'm the kind of person who would like do that because I'm awesome. Uh, so, uh, once again, I am Shane Fitzgerald. Uh, my player two tonight has been Ian McIntosh. Grand old time. Yeah, and once more. Uh, to Chris Barasa, co-founder of Red Oak Studios. Thank you very much for being on the show. Okay, no problem. Thanks again. All right. So until next time, keep riding the circuit, play fair, play on.